With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, wages and inflation are taking a toll on wine grape production around the state. We'll have more on that. But we start off today with USDA trade officials who are expecting to see an increased export sales to Colombia after a recent trade mission there. Gary Crawford has details. In the South American country of Colombia, incomes are rising, supermarkets and other food outlets are expanding, and as that happens... Opportunities really abound for a diverse uh, range of U.S. consumer-oriented exports. And so, Under Secretary of Agriculture for Trade Alexis Taylor was in Colombia last week heading up a U.S. agricultural trade mission to try to take advantage of some of those opportunities. On a special phone hookup from Bogota, Taylor told U.S. reporters. As we think about uh, priority for USDA, which is market diversification, there are several parts of the world that are really key to that effort. Uh, Latin and South America is one of those regions. Um, And I think Colombia is really a priority as we look for growth opportunities with rising incomes, rising middle classes for much of what U.S. uh, food and agriculture can produce and looks to export. Taylor said that USDA and other groups have studied the Colombian market, a market where the buying power of consumers is growing. And so for them, they look to diversify um, the food products that they're buying. Um, One opportunity um, that we have is around wine, Um, and we actually have a wine company uh, on our trade mission. But also um, new diverse sources of protein, dairy, um, turkey, pork, uh, fish, uh, seafood products um, are also all on the trade mission being represented this week. And then uh, also a company um, uh, who are focused on consumer packaged goods, but uh, uh, doing some additional uh, nuts. Uh, um, products and export, looking to export some uh, new nut products. On this mission, there were representatives from 12 U.S. agricultural associations and 23 food and agricultural businesses. Today, those 23 uh, food and agricultural businesses participated in 267 business-to-business meetings with 170 additional meetings planned for day two. Meetings with over 50 potential buyers. And how did those meetings go? What we've heard generally from just the first day of B2B meetings is a lot of really positive reception from the buyers in this market. A market that is already the seventh largest market for U.S. food and ag products. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The latest round of USDA's Higher Blends Infrastructure Incentive Program Grant Awards continues to expand fuel station capabilities to bring higher blends of ethanol to motorists and consumers. Rod Bain reports. How important to the biofuel industry is a USDA program emphasizing biofuels infrastructure construction and expansion? HBIP has been, I think, a success story when it comes to a public-private partnership and helping industry better distribute and create market access for low-carbon fuels. Incentivize retailers to offer higher blends of ethanol is critical, and the HBIP program has been wonderful in helping a lot of those retailers. And We're working with retailers to make sure that we maximize This is a tremendous amount of resources. One of the things that we're very happy about with the most recent round is because that's a lot of equipment. Members of the biofuels industry offering their opinions and support regarding Higher Blends Infrastructure Incentive Program. HBIP. Ron Lamberty of the American Coalition of Ethanol was among those attending his organization's annual conference when Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack announced the latest awards regarding HBIP. Over $90 million allocated to 89 projects in 26 states. Every quarter, they're going to continue to see higher and higher numbers of those grants and more opportunities for that higher blend to get in the mix. What the secretary is referring to is HBIP set up as a quarterly grant program with money awarded in a series of tranches from a total $500 million. Prior to the August secretarial announcement of the latest HBIP awards, that has resulted in us funding to date 193 projects, spending roughly $131 million of that $500 million. The next round of HBIP grant award applications are being accepted through September 30th. 
Ron Laberty of ACE explains what HBIP is designed to do. It's a grant that stations can get for putting in infrastructure, dispensers, tanks, lines, anything that they need to sell higher blends of ethanol, and it's blends above 10%. So even a station that's putting in E15, maybe not putting in E85, can get some of that money. And as for the impact of the higher blends infrastructure incentive program, Jeff Cooper of the Renewable Fuels Association attest. Hugely beneficial to the industry and hugely impactful for our industry. The HBIP program has put hundreds of millions of dollars into the marketplace. It has stimulated retailers to make the investments necessary to distribute higher blends of ethanol, whether that's E15 or E85. And we've seen substantial growth in the number of stations offering those fuels to consumers, and HBIP has been a big reason for that. More details about HBIP are available online at www.rd.usda.gov slash HBIP. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. You are listening to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. With today's National Spotlight, here's Cindy Zimmerman. All right, Randy, if you would first, please introduce yourself for me. Uh, Randy Gard. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Bossman Enterprises, Secretary of the Nebraska Ethanol Board. Well, you were here at the American Coalition for Ethanol's annual meeting, and uh, you received an award here, the the Grassroots Award, which is, I mean, all, all of ACE's awards are important, but this is, this is one that talks about people that come get things done from the grassroots level. And uh, so tell me a little bit about your journey um, as it relates to ACE and how they um, helped you do a better job being a retailer. Well, this goes clear back to 2015, 2016, when the Bosman family asked me to figure out fuel. And I said, didn't know much about it, but let me see what I can do. And then within a matter of a few days, you know, Ron Lamberty from ACE stops in the office and starts asking me about RINs, ethanol RINs. And I got somewhat upset with him, kind of kicked him out of the office. Uh, but then as he got down the road, I got to thinking the guy might be right that we just simply don't know that much about it. So when it was all said and done, it's you know going on, what, eight years now? Mm-hmm. Where um, with Ron's help, Ace's help, we've been able to connect the dots, figure out, figure out how to blend higher blends of ethanol, even biodiesel and some of the other renewable products. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been a marvelous journey for us, and we're just getting started. What has it meant for your company? Uh, it's a cornerstone of what we do. I was explaining to Ron a little bit ago that what we do when we look at either buying a location, building a location, in our financial pro forma we put together, a core component of that is the higher blend um, economics and how many gallons we think we can sell. And honestly, it it benefits us financially and it shores up the pro forma that if we put higher blends in, we, we, you know, we, we're willing to pay a little bit more to, to, uh, to buy a store or even build one. Well, what would you say to other retailers who have so far not done that? Uh, you're crazy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm being careful with that one. But, no, I think at the end of the day is that we're in the business to make money. And the cornerstone of any convenience store or travel center is fuel. And we know that economics are really tight when it comes to fuel. We know we'll chase we chase pennies. We don't chase dimes and nickels and quarters. And higher blends help us sell more gallons, make more money on those gallons, and we're just better off for it. So it, at, when it's all said and done, if you're not doing it, y- yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, the HBIP program through USDA, has that helped you or, uh, in, in getting more higher blends out there? I'll tell you what. Without HBIP, and without the state uh, higher blend incentive uh, bill that got passed a couple of years ago, we probably wouldn't have done it. Mm-hmm. Or certainly not done it to the scale uh, that we've done it so far. Uh, I mean, it, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. It's 35000 for a blender pump, $100,000 for a tank, plus cement, plus piping, plus everything else. So it's not a, it's, it's a leap of faith. If you say, if I put this stuff in, you know, will I sell more gallons? Can I make more money at it? And having HBIP and some of these other uh, grant programs certainly help soften, you know, the the anxiety of doing something like that. 
And you would recommend other retailers to look into HBIP? No, I wouldn't recommend it. I'd tell them they should. And no, no, let me rephrase that. No, they have to. <laughs> this, isn't a, this is not a suggestion. You have to do this. This is good for you. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Anything else you want to ask? No, ma'am. All right. Well, congratulations here at the American Coalition for Ethanol's annual meeting. I'm Cindy Zip. That was today's National Spotlight. Now here's Rod Bain with the Livestock Report. Minor month-over-month adjustments were recorded in USDA's August look at meat production and prices for this year. But as World Agricultural Outlook Board Chair Mark Jekodowski indicates... The overall story hasn't changed much from last month and several of the previous months going back a while. Reflected in trends such as higher slaughter rates for cattle. Beef production for the current calendar year, 2024, we raised by 80 million pounds this month. So now we're at about 26.74 billion pounds of U.S. beef production. And this month's increase was just truing up to recent data. So a little bit higher slaughter pace, partially offset by lower weights. Steer prices remain strong, strong demand for fed cattle. So really just based on observed prices, we raised our steer price forecast by $1.25 per hundred weight. It is now at $188.11 per hundred weight for 2024. And that's expected to continue to increase into 2025. This month's forecast growth continues into the first quarter 2025 and combines with price increases we've been expecting for some time. So 2025 steer price forecast now at $190.75 per hundred weight. That would be up $2.64 per hundred weight year over year and lower slaughter rates for hogs. Pork production reduced about 90 million pounds this month, and that mainly is truing up to recent data, so third quarter slaughter data, lower and lower weights combining there as well. No change in 2025. We raised our hog price forecast by 25 cents per hundred weight, so it's now at $59.38 per hundred weight for 2024, but we're expecting to see some weakness going into 2025. We reduced our forecast by a dollar per hundred weight for the new calendar year. And so it's now at $57.75 per hundred weight. And that would be down a dollar 63 year over year. And that just reflects a little bit, relatively speaking, weaker demand for pork that we've been observing lately. Growing broiler production. Broilers, no change in our 2025 production forecast, but for 2024, truing up to recent production and hatchery data suggests about a 100 million pound increase in broiler production up to about 46.9 billion pounds of broiler production. For 2024, really just truing price forecasts up to recent data. Broiler price forecast is raised by one and a half cents per pound. It's now at 128.8 cents per pound. And that pulls some strength into 2025 as well. We raised our price forecast next year by 1.3 cents per pound. I'm Rod Bain reporting. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with a preview of what you'll hear today on Agnet West, here's Brian German. California's 2024 peach crop forecast is looking good with a 6% increase from last year, hitting 510,000 tons. According to the USDA Fruit and Nut Outlook report, freestone peaches are up 8% and clingstone peaches are up 4%. Freestone peaches mainly hit the fresh market while clingstones go into canning and freezing. Despite a warm winter and low chill hours, good spring weather helped to boost the crop. However, high summer temperatures in the Central Valley might affect fruit quality. Clingstone peaches are expected to reach 230,000 tons, a slight increase from 2023, though significantly below early 2000s levels. Prices have stayed flat with a 2024 base price agreement of $635 per ton. Canned fruit prices have stabilized after a sharp rise in 2022. The Environmental Protection Agency has recently approved a new treatment for foodborne pathogens in irrigation water. BioSafe Systems announced that their product, Sanidate 12.0, has been approved by the EPA for reducing harmful bacteria like E. coli and salmonella in pre-harvest agricultural irrigation water. This is the first product of its kind to receive such approval. Sanidate 12.0 uses peroxyacidic acid to kill the pathogens, which are common causes of foodborne illnesses and recalls. 
The product is designed to enhance food safety by targeting bacteria in irrigation water before crops are harvested. This recent approval marks a significant achievement for Biosafe Systems, making them the only company with EPA-registered solutions for both pre-harvest and post-harvest bacterial control. The recent updates to the farm loan programs from the USDA's Farm Service Agency are expected to provide a variety of benefits to farm businesses. FSA Administrator Zach Ducheneau explained that one of the benefits to the changes in farm loan programs will be a reduction in the frequency of borrowers needing to put up their personal residence as collateral for a farm loan. With this rule, if we do not need it to get to a one-to-one -one security position, we will not take the primary residence as additional security to get there. We're going to put the homestead protection in these transactions at the front end of this instead of waiting till we get to the end and having to rely on bankruptcy protections or other homestead protection acts. We want to make sure that that's off the table because in some of our visits around the country, that's been the biggest stressor for some of our producers. Increasing wages and inflation are taking a toll on wine grape production. During a panel discussion, President of Allied Grape Growers Jeff Bitter told the California State Board of Food and Agriculture about some of the economic challenges facing the industry. Everybody's complaining, including us as consumers, inflation, interest rates, etc. The amount of overhead created by costs involved with increasing inputs and labor over the years, you know, we've gone from $10 an hour to 16 just in a few short years. That's a huge amount of appreciation and cost. We have not seen commensurate price increases in commodity Prices are great value in this case. So that's been a huge deal for us as an industry, particularly when you fold in the elimination of the ag overtime exemption. And so we're really struggling. I would say if there's any one issue besides water in some cases, but any one issue that's huge for us in our industry, it's the uh, cost of labor. A California red scale workshop is coming up in October in Exeter. The workshop is designed to help PCAs recognize the various life stages of California red scale and their parasites. It's going to be held at the Lynn Cove Research and Extension Center on Wednesday, October 2nd. The workshop will consist of lecture presentations covering monitoring and best management practices and will be accompanied by microscope sessions to help with the identification of scale stages, including molts and instars, as well as differentiation of males and females. There will also be a visit to a field with an ongoing CRS trial to observe the effects of different pesticide products, monitoring, and hanging pheromone. Class size is limited to 30 participants, so early sign-up is recommended, and more information about the workshop is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. A look at dairy price forecasts, that's coming up on this line of hours. World Agricultural Outlook Board Chair Mark Jakanowski goes over this month's USDA price forecasts for dairy categories, classes, and all milk prices. We reduced our butter price forecast by a penny a pound, $2.99 per pound. But other than butter, for 2024, all of our other main component dairy prices were raised this month. And the class prices were all raised as well. And all milk price reflects the class prices. So our 2024 all milk price was raised by $0.05 cents per hundredweight. Now forecast at $22.30 per hundredweight. And we expect the strength to continue into the next calendar year in 2025, so where we have the all milk price at $22.75 per hundredweight, and that would be up 45 cents year over year. World Agricultural Outlook Board Chair Mark Jekinowski. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. This segment is brought to you by Live Earth Products. To get to know a little more about Live Earth Products, we're talking on the phone today with Vice President Russell Taylor. What about humates and animal feed? When can you add humates to the animal feed and what is the benefit of that? So the interesting thing about animal feeds is just like the fertilizer side, there's actually a lot going on in legislative processes. So there's an act out called the Innovative Feed Act. And currently, you can't include things in animal feed that are giving you other benefits besides nutritive benefits. Let's say, for example, you had a cow that was eating a product that reduced its methane emissions, that those enteric gases that are caused just in the natural digestion of a ruminating cow. You can't claim that those products do that benefit. So hopefully uh, people will get involved and say, look, the Innovative Feed Act is 
necessary and should help farmers. Other benefits of feeding humate is obviously first to reduce enteric gases. But the second one, these are old plant materials. So the, those plant materials are rich in trace minerals. So not only are you getting something that's going to help the digestion of the animal, you're also getting an abundant supply of minerals. So that is the main reason farmers are currently including in their animal feeds. This is all fascinating, but it can be hard to retain some of this information when you're hearing this um, on the radio or through the podcast. So is there someplace online or where can our listeners go and get more information? Well, the good news is the acts I mentioned, like the Innovative Feed Act and the Plant Biostimulant Act are publicly available through Congress. You can actually go look at those acts that are on the website there. The other information you can get is directly through Live Earth Products. So if you go to liveearth.com, contact us. You can contact us and our agronomy team. And we're happy to go over any details, questions about how to use these products, how they fit your farm program, how to use them as a tool to implement conservation practices such as nutrient retention, water conservation, and improving soil health. To get to know more about Live Earth products, you can visit them online at liveearth.com. That is spelled L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. Some of those connected by the position they held at the Agriculture Department, top economic advisor, recently reconnected through an Agricultural Outlook Forum, with discussions centered on their time at USDA and some of the issues they faced. Rod Bain reveals some of this history of USDA's economic mission area in this edition of Agriculture USA. A unique view of the U.S. Agriculture Department was provided at this year's Agricultural Outlook Forum, one provided by those who previously served as the department's top economic advisors. Selfishly, I really was looking forward to this session simply because I get to associate myself with people. Secondly, I'm going to learn a lot about what they've dealt with as chief economists. I'm Rod Bain. Current Chief Economist Seth Meyer joins us and some of his predecessors within the Agriculture Department as they discuss aspects of the history of the economics mission area of USDA in this edition of Agriculture USA. Agriculture Department Chief Economist Seth Meyer had a distinct honor at the 2024 USDA Ag Outlook Forum introducing a panel session featuring some of his predecessors in the position. Moderating this prestigious panel was someone with his own unique history within the USDA's economic mission area. My professional roots run through the Office of Economics. My first job when I got out of undergraduate was a part-time GS-5 staff assistant job in the forecast support group of the Economic Research Service, then called ESCS. Randy Russell would advance to become Chief of Staff and Deputy Agriculture Secretary for Economics during John Block's term as Ag Secretary in the early to mid-1980s. I think about the most basic functions of the Department of Agriculture, I can think of two. And the first is good basic ag research. But the second is also providing strong economic data, policy analysis, and statistics so that farmers and ranchers and people throughout the value chain can make informed decisions. Russell's panel consisted of two former USDA chief economists and two of their predecessors. One of the things that I enjoyed the most after I left was seeing the publications of the research that I requested churn out a year and two years after I left USDA. But whether you're talking to a congressman or a member of the Cattlemen's Association, you've got to realize these are really smart, capable people who don't have enough time, and they want you to give them some information. They also don't want your, at least in my in my case, your policy opinion. They want your policy analysis. Those are the voices of former USDA Assistant Secretaries of Economics, Robert Thompson and Dan Sumner. Thompson served in the capacity for two years under Agriculture Secretaries John Block and Richard Ling in the mid-1980s, while Sumner was Assistant Secretary for two secretaries in the early 1990s, Ed Madigan and Mike Espy. It would be in 1994 under the Agriculture Reorganization Act that the Office of the Chief Economist was established. The role of Chief Economist in reviewing all of the cost-benefit analyses is an important role, and I firmly think that if an agency is going to put out a regulation, the public needs to know what its expected costs and benefits are. And I think OCE always has, and still does to this day, do a great job in making sure that that function is done. Rob Johansson served as Chief Economist 
during part of the first term of Secretary Tom Vilsack and during the term of Secretary Sonny Perdue. During the Perdue administration, he also performed duties as acting undersecretary for the then newly established Farm Production and Conservation Mission Area. Joe Hansen is not the only former chief economist to have served double duty. In 2007, had gone over to the trade rep's office. I was the chief ag negotiator in Geneva, and I was called, and I said I wanted to apply for the job for chief economist. Long story is they said, great, you can be chief economist, but you still have to be chief ag negotiator. So for 2008, I had both jobs. That's Joe Glover, who served as USDA chief economist under secretaries Ed Schaefer and Tom Vilsack. Now, if one were to think about the time of service for these former top USDA economic advisors, you could also probably come up with some of the most prominent issues facing agriculture at the time and how they dealt with such matters. From the farm crisis of the 1980s to reorganization of USDA in the 90s to ag trade issues of the past several decades, plus recession and a global pandemic. One area that the current and future agriculture chief economists will work on, according to Randy Russell, establishment of environmental markets. There's no question we're going to be paying more attention to climate. Whether or not we do it through the sort of programs we've got now, that's not as obvious to me. This has been Agriculture USA. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey takes a look at the nation's cotton crop. The cotton crop continues to perform reasonably well despite some extreme heat, especially in Texas over the last week. Now, a cotton condition, we did see just a, a very slight overall decline in the net numbers. That was mostly from a drop in the good to excellent ratings. Current numbers, August 18th, 42% good to excellent, down four points from last week. We actually saw a, well, we saw a one-point increase then in the very poor-to-poor -poor ratings, 26% this week. That's up a point from the previous week. Even with that decline, we're looking better than this time a year ago. Mid-August numbers in 2023 showing just 33% good to excellent and 46% very poor-to-poor. -poor. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Here is today's featured interview with the National Milk Producers Federation. I'm Lori Boyer. I'm visiting with Chris Galen, Senior Vice President of Member Services and Governance with the National Milk Producers Federation. As we were gearing up for this interview, you mentioned uh, we'll start here with some Capitol Hill activity, which has been not a lot as they're on recess, but <laughs> a lot right. of the conversations. Yeah, it's kind of a lack of activity, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the conversations that I've been having amongst the ag industry is now we are turning more from hopes of an actual farm bill to now looking to make sure we get an extension of the current extended right. farm bill. Right. So this is the kicking the can down the road another series of months or maybe even a year, Lori. Uh, anything that happens in a presidential election year is always kind of a dicey prospect to begin with. And so there's still some outside chance. I don't want to say it's a zero percent, but it's an outside chance that the, uh, the Congress, when they come back, not just this fall before the elections, but when they come back after the November elections in what's called the lame duck session. They'll do that probably right before, right after Thanksgiving. Uh, they're going to have to tackle budget issues in all likelihood, and the farm bill is a possibility. So I think, though, a lot of that will be, will be dependent on how those elections go. And uh, do we have a Democratic president-elect or a Republican? Uh, do we have uh, a changeover in who controls Congress coming in January compared to what we have right now, which is a reminder, of course, the Republicans have uh, the control in the House of Representatives and the Democrats in the Senate. And so that's been a, a, a big impediment to agreeing on a bill that can pass both of those chambers. So as you said, uh, if, if they can't come to terms either before or after the elections, then in all likelihood they're going to have to do an extension for another year, uh, which everyone agrees to. So I don't think that that's the question. It's just a question of how long that process will take. Okay. All right, Chris. Well, I don't have a whole lot of questions on that. So 
If it comes back up, that's fine. Moving yeah, on. Yeah, I would just say for, for dairy, oh. just to, to summarize, there's not a lot of things that are major to do's in the farm bill for us. So uh, there, there's some things we'd like to see, but not necessarily things that we need. And a lot of times legislation, whether it's the farm bill or just overall here in Washington, it, it's people whose wheels are the squeakiest, the ones who are making the most noise uh, and, and have a greater greatest sense of urgency. Those are the ones that drive the process. And for this year, for better or for worse, uh, and this farm bill, it's not necessarily the dairy sector. Chris, what do dairy economics in general look like right now? Well, and, and part of the reason for my last answer, which is why we're not the squeakiest wheel among all the different farm and ag commodities, is, is that conditions are getting better. I wouldn't say it's happy days are here again, but we're looking at much better margins, the difference between milk prices and feed costs as we go into the summer. Uh, we, we just saw in June uh, the best margin, according to the USDA's Dairy Margin Coverage Program, the best that we've seen in the last two years, and we expect that trend to continue. So obviously the wild card is going to be what's the harvest going to be like in the corn belt, what's the price of corn and beans going to be, because that's a big part of, of feeding cows. Uh, but uh, milk prices are strong. Milk production really has been very flat the last two or three years, and so that's a big reason why now we're seeing stronger prices is because even though um, feed prices have moderated, no one's really in an expansion mode right now, whether it's in Colorado or anywhere else in the country. And so that's keeping a lid on production and that's keeping a lid on um, on how low prices are and hopefully giving us more upside there. And as for the rest of the year, what do you, what is the take or what is the yeah, prospects? So the rest of the year, I would just say at this point here with, with about four or five months to go, it doesn't look like we will see margins dip down to the point where the dairy margin coverage program kicks in. So that's that's for us kind of the barometer as to are margins good, are they mediocre, are they really bad? We saw really bad margins last year, unfortunately, and, and this year things are, are better and, and trending better still. All right, Chris, thank you for that. And then, of course, we continue to talk about the bird flu that is still going on mm, in a number yeah. of states, but Colorado, you're... Last I checked, we were still number one as far as the amount of cases that we've had. <laughs> yeah, not not something you want to be uh, number one at, but I think a lot of that is just Colorado's dairy sector is really concentrated in Weld County, and you don't have a huge number of herds. It's not California. It's not even, um, you know, Texas or Michigan that have uh, multiple herds. Uh, I mean, Colorado obviously has multiple herds, but it doesn't have multiple thousands. So, uh, you know, that, that's where the concern is, obviously. And, and just there's more testing happening there. Uh, Michigan's another state where they're doing a lot of testing. Obviously, if you're, if you're moving animals interstate between states, you've got to test. Uh, that's the, the USDA's mandate. Uh, what we heard recently from a USDA official, Lori, is that given the work that the states are doing, and the federal uh, government as well. It doesn't look like they're going to try to do anything more, what's the right word, more severe, more invasive in terms of additional testing. Now, obviously, uh, states still have their prerogatives, and, and, that, and you're seeing that play out there in Colorado. But hopefully the good news is that, um, you know, with, with the compensation programs available from USDA um, and the fact that the virus, although it's uh, really bad for poultry, uh, most cows are recovering from it. If it doesn't infect herds, dairy herds, uh, you know, we'll be able to get through this year, hopefully, before we see the return of, of wetter, cooler weather in the wintertime. I think that's the biggest concern is really trying to do whatever we can to keep this from being a chronic issue and just keeping it be uh, an acute situation. And recognizing, you know, that it, it does exist in, in the wild population, not just birds, but other species as well. It's the more you look for it, the more different animals you find that at least in one-off cases, animals can track this out in the wild. It's not just the avian population. Um, so, but the more we can do to keep it out of our domestic bird flocks and cattle flocks, I think the better off. We'll continue with the National Milk Producers Federation right after this. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. We continue now with our featured interview. Even though you and I are talking about dairy cow capacity, we've had to put down lots and lots of poultry because of it. And I know USDA yeah. has put in a fair amount of money for farm worker safety methods, yeah. flu shots, and things like that. 
Yeah, the other development on, on that point, Laura, I'm glad to mention it, is that last week the USDA said, actually what USDA was the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, that they're going to be spending uh, several million dollars uh, doing outreach to farm workers, trying to get them to be to be vaccinated for the seasonal flu, you know, the regular flu shot that a lot of people get in the fall, with, the, with you know, the goal of public health, which is that when these viruses mix together, and we saw this with the arrival of the coronavirus more than four years ago, that when viruses mix between animal species and then between animals and humans, that's when you can get some, some really bad outcomes. Uh, you know, that's kind of where the flu comes from every fall. And so if you can prevent the people who are most at risk from exposure to the H5N1 bird flu, uh, which are farm workers, right? I mean, those are the people that we know have gotten sick here in the last six months. And, and if we keep them from getting the regular flu, the seasonal flu, in addition to the bird flu, then, then hopefully we prevent that worst case possible scenario where the avian flu, the bird flu, gets like supercharged because it also then takes on traits of, of human seasonal influenza and becomes much more contagious. And that's what we don't want to happen. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris. Now, another question I have for you. So like our Colorado Cattlemen's Association are really keeping an eye on this, just in case this were to get into like feedlot cattle or other cattle yeah. cattle. Have you heard of any other instances anywhere else where that's happened? I have not. And, you know, that's the interesting thing is, is that we're still trying to figure out exactly the route of transmission, I mean, you know, we know that it got introduced by wild birds into some uh, larger dairies in West Texas and New Mexico sometime probably either late last year or early this year. And then in a lot of cases, it moved as animals are transported from uh, the southern plains, you know, up to Michigan and up to Idaho and, and the other states that have been impacted. Um, you know, what right now we're trying to figure out, and you, you may know more about this from your conversations with the state vet down in Denver, is that, you know, we think that it has been moved somehow between uh, now the dairy herds and commercial poultry flocks in Colorado, in Michigan, in a couple of other states, but we don't exactly know how. Is it the birds themselves flying? Is it the, thing, is it the virus transmitted on the wind? Or is it more likely possibly you know, being moved on humans who work uh, at, at multiple places or they share housing with people who work in multiple you know, poultry farms, cattle farms, or is it maybe the delivery trucks of feed, of fuel, uh, services like that that go between different farms regardless of the species? And I, I don't think we know the answer to that yet, and that's one of the things that's probably frustrating or challenging some of the efforts to eradicate the virus. I do visit with our state veterinarian, Dr. Maggie Baldwin, monthly, so I'll get more information from her here in a few days. But last check, the initial findings were the latter of what you said, Chris. Uh, movement, whether it be on a person, clothing, people, or on people, machinery, yeah. trailers, trucks, tires, all those things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and then it becomes harder to control because it's easy to say, well, you put masks and booties on a person, and then they're fine, but that doesn't always work in a dairy environment. Right. It works any better in a large uh, egg laying operation or, or boilers or turkeys. And then, you know, if it's on a truck tire or something like that, then it gets to be really a challenge. Exactly. Exactly. All right, Chris, anything else to mention here today? Uh, no, other than, you know, we're now in the election season. Obviously, we heard the news just yesterday um, that Governor Waltz of Minnesota is going to be working with the vice president to try and get elected to the White House. And then you have former President Trump and Senator Vance on the Republican side. So it should be, you know, an interesting next, uh, it's roughly about 90 days now to the November elections. It'll be hard fought and it's going to be a toss up election in all likelihood. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see how much rural policy or food policy plays in here. I don't think it'll be a front and center issue, uh, but obviously one thing that we all have in common, red or blue states, whatever your po political stripes is, we all have to eat. And we all care to varying degrees about where food comes from. So it'll be interesting to see how much of that actually gets um, injected into the, some of the conversation about the elections and people's visions for the next four years. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit AgNetWest online at agnetwest.com.
You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halvertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.